Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to give just a brief overview of the various regions of the country and the economic and political forces that are active in these different places. So uh, just again, a brief overview, and then next time we'll get back and uh, we'll push our narrative forward. So as you can see here, there's, there's a growing disparity in the demographics of the northern and southern states. The northern population, the number of factories, the miles of railroad, the amount of money is just simply outstripping what the south can produce. Although cash crops used to be the main way to generate money in the, in the United States, at this point, industrialization is really taking over. And we're starting to see the absolute power of industrialization and how agrarian production, as lucrative as it is, simply can't keep pace. So let's talk about how this affected the various areas here. So in the north, of course, we're continuing to see the growth of cities. We're seeing the growth of the middle class and the upper class. We're starting to see the rise of industrialists and uh, the first robber barons and all this all these, these guys uh, growing in power and influence in cities in the north. We're also seeing technological growth leading to a spectacular explosion of manufacturing, again, predominantly across northern cities. The invention of the Singer sewing machine is, of course, going to significantly increase the amount of textile cl of cloth and clothing that can be produced, as well as improving the quality of the work and uh, significantly increasing the profitability of these businesses. We're also going to see an explosion in the growth of cities, both some cities in the upper and so some cities in sort of the upper Midwest or sort of the old Midwest here, like Chicago and Cincinnati and St. Louis, but also a massive explosion in places like Brooklyn, Philadelphia, things like that, Boston. This is a picture of New York City in the 1850s. And so we start to see a spectacular explosion of population there. All of this is going to necessitate uh, a larger government response because this many people living in this, these close quarters are going to create problems with waste, with conflict, with crime, disease, things like that, that need to be addressed. Outbreaks of cholera, typhoid, things like that are going to uh, become common and cities are going to need to grow and expand their sort of municipal services if they're going to be able to, to uh, keep this in check. This led to the rise of political machines. The most famous of these is Tammany Hall in New York City. Tammany Hall provides a social safety net, provides some measure of sanitation, provides some workplace uh, po placement, things like that. And in exchange, they expect you to show up on election day and vote for them. The Tammany machine is going to utterly control New York politics for the next approximately 100 years. And, of course, is also going to get involved in massive amounts of graft, corruption, theft, things like that, because the amount of money flowing through these urban centers is just so much larger than it used to be. And so that much money is going to corrupt, and uh, we'll, deal with how, we'll deal with the aftermath of this when we start getting into the Gilded Age. So there's Boss Tweed feasting on the corpse of New York City, along with his other cronies. He's a vulture in this, in this political cartoon. And in this one, of course, he's got a head, but it's really a, a bag of money. We also see a spectacular growth in Irish immigration to the United States during this time period. We see a spike because of the Irish potato famine, leading to a massive surplus of cheap labor, which, of course, is going to massively boost industrialization, but also lead to abuses of Irish people who were uh, generally, again, poor and didn't have much ability to advocate for themselves or for better working conditions. It also led to a significant rise in nativism with the rise of the American party, arguing that Native Americans like us need to be worried about these inferior Irish people coming in because they're Catholic and they're poor and they're going to take over our country and all this other stuff. And so this party became known as the Know Nothing Party. Uh, we see some race riots in places like Philadelphia, New York City, places like that, as nativist gangs start attacking uh, Irish immigrants. And we see some very well-reasoned arguments in Know Nothing newspapers. I clearly can't see any fallacies with any of this. Basically, just take it at face value. Clearly, all of it true. Lincoln, of course, uh, sees the massive hypocrisy here. And the Know Nothing, the rise of the Know Nothing Party is going to be a significant problem for the Whigs because they are generally the party of urban workers. And so they're alienating all of these immigrants who are going to become a significant portion of voters in the North. And they're going to push immigrants into the Democratic Party, which is far more ironically tolerant of them. 
We also see a spectacular growth in railroad and, and uh, the amount of mileage of railroads. You can see here in the red, specifically into the old, into the western areas of the north. And so we see a huge railroad building boom led by people like Cornelius Vanderbilt, here, who here is uh, controlling several different railroads by buying out his competitors and building these, building a massive railroad trust. We'll talk more about trusts in, next, in our next unit in the Gilded Age, but for now, just know Cornelius Vanderbilt is growing spectacularly wealthy because of the railroad monopoly that he is creating. Uh, take a moment and pause and read the construction of the railroad and the, and the components of this, and then we'll move on. And then you've got the West. The West is, uh, at this point, the frontier of America is this sort of untamed virgin lands, quote unquote, that people, uh, if they're heading West on the Oregon or other trails, can go out West and start over. There's still a significant amount of land if you're willing to kick the Native Americans off of it. And so this is the place where, uh, this is the, the wild frontier of the United States. We also see a massive surge in immigration here, specifically from Asia. Uh, unrest in China, a combination of the Opium Wars and the Taiping Rebellion, leads to a surge in Chinese immigration, who are employed as farm workers, laborers, miners, things like that, and generally face large amounts of discrimination because, you know, not their non-whiteness. So the West Coast is a relatively diverse place. And of course, as the population grows, we see a massive surge in conflict with Native Americans, which happens for all the reasons that we talked about previously. Uh, in the Whitman massacre, a group of Native Americans attacked a missionary family, accusing them of spreading disease amongst the Native Americans, which eh, maybe. And in the end, the treaty that was signed significantly decreased the amount of land that Native Americans got. You can see all the land seeded here in this map. And the story is basically the same as all the stories that we've talked about so far. In the South, uh, things are also staying mostly the same. Uh, in the 1860s in the South, the vast majority of Southerners were poor subsistence farmers who did not own slaves, but the very, very wealthy cream of the Southern crop, the uh, slave-holding elite, are going to hold most of the government positions, and it's going to be their views that are going to be most represented in uh, accounts from the South at this time. Because of this, there is some industrialization in the South, especially some growth of textile mills and some railroads. But the South is mostly going to double down on plantation agriculture and slavery. And as you can see here, most of the investment is going to come from the North and the North is going to economically is going to the South is going to be economically dependent on the North, which is, of course, going to become incredibly problematic in case, you know, they ever decide to have a civil war against each other. So. That's, so that's our sectionalism for today. Hopefully you can uh, write about these in some detail. And when we come back, we'll pick, a, we'll pick it up with uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act and we'll start moving our narrative forward. Thank you for listening.